worry about looking at people who are doing things that you wish you were doing. Don't compare yourself to them, but learn from them. Hey guys, Nathan Chan here, CEO and publisher of Founder Magazine. Welcome back to another Founder interview. Today we're here in hometown, homegrown Melbourne, Australia. And we're here with uh, my good friend, Rob Ward, who is the co-founder of Quadlock. And uh, we're gonna be talking about how he started this company, uh, how he's grown it, and uh, everything in between. So, Rob, this is the second time. Thank you so much for yeah. coming back no, on, thank man. Thank you, man. Always a pleasure, always a pleasure. <laughs> the first question I ask everyone that comes on is, uh, how'd you get your job? You don't go out searching for the job you end up having. I think that's definitely a point that you don't realize until till somewhere down the track, I suppose. But yeah, we were just, um, to be honest, back in the early days, we were just doing things. Yep. Different businesses, different bits and pieces at that time, seeing what was moving in the market, seeing what tools were becoming available, seeing you know, what opportunities were out there, really. And then um, as we saw different opportunities, we jumped on them. And I think jumping on some of the first things we did were great because they, they turned out to be not the things we, we worked out we wanted to do long term. And so from doing those things, we sort of thought, okay, what we actually probably want to do looks more like this. And then we started chasing that. And then we started going down that kind of more uh, consumer product, online type business, but still with that sort of design product angle, becoming a e-com is sort of the, the vessel to float the rest of that, I suppose. So what was the first product? It was you and Chris, what was the first product? Your co-founder, what did you guys, what yeah. were you work on? Was it the, was it the bottle opener? Yeah, I, to, the pers- first consumer product in within this sort of business that we have now was, but the truth be told, we were doing other little businesses well before that, that, that ended, ended us up there. So we'd done a bit of, you know, website, bit of SEO, we've done- Oh, we've, really? We've, yeah, we brought in um, small format laser machines, which was like an opportunity I saw for a long time. And uh, we just hadn't done anything with it. So we brought in these small format laser machines and sort of built them up, made them a better machine and, and sold them. And that, that was a great little business, did really well. Really? We, we um, ran a blog called 3dprinters.com.au. Um, then we made 3D Printers Australia. We did that for a while. That was a great little business, sold to like lots of schools, all the unis, things like that. And we just sort of used all those little businesses. This all happened in, I think like a couple of years. Yeah. We used all those little businesses to sort of work out sort of where we wanted to be. And then we saw things like Shopify and Kickstarter and um, like Facebook and these kind of things kicking off and becoming, I suppose, the barriers to entry, you know, um, access to the market, access to people, those things falling down around us. We thought, yeah, we, we, we can use some of these awesome new tools and these new I don't know, liberties that we have. Our initial kind of business is where you had to talk to everyone that you were pretty much selling a product to. And then we sort of pivoted into that sort of more scalable approach where, you know, we don't, we love talking to customers, but we don't talk to hardly any. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. So um, how'd you and Chris meet? We originally met through, um, he was with uh, one of the uni wakeboard um, clubs and one of my mates ran one of those clubs. Yeah. And so we met there and then we became better mates uh, because his girlfriend, now wife, and my girlfriend, now wife, uh, we're best mates at school. So ah. yeah, th- that's how we started hanging out away from that other scene. Gotcha. Yeah. And we were always talking about just ideas and cool stuff and yeah. And then we just thought we'd try something. And like you, so you've done like a lot of different products by the sounds of it. A few, yep. but all pretty different. But your first online one play was the Kickstarter. Yeah, first proper e-commerce play was, was uh, opener the opener case the iphone bottle opener i mean even that was the first sort of way we scaled that but we were still our other businesses were still really heavily relying on the internet to to do a better job of them than yes. probably the current players in those space were doing and what but happened? you could only scale them so far and then we decided yeah let's we saw kickstarter and we actually thought rather than like having the idea and thinking how do we get this idea off the ground what it was is we saw Kickstarter, Shopify, you know, um, 3PLs. And what would a product look like that we could go and leverage all these tools? And that sort of, we come up with it backwards, I suppose. Yeah, so you launched 
the you know iPhone open case and what happened to like the 3dprinting.com like even that's a good domain name like yeah, what happened yeah, to all sold that, man? that sold you sold that. it yeah sold the blog um not for heaps or anything and then um at that point it was just like we sold the um the laser business yep to someone who was working in it at the yep. time which worked out really well i mean they got a steal and we got out of you know that business effectively because it was just the opportunity was so much greater on the other side it was like it's like th those businesses actually funded the start of the other businesses and we just sort of rolled on from that so it wasn't trying to like make a killing on exiting that business it was just trying to like move on have someone run it take care of our customers keep going with it while we could go on to do the thing we really wanted to do yeah that's an interesting one because i think sometimes when you get to a certain point in business you've got so many different opportunities yeah. and how do you know which ones to chase yeah. and like in that point in time how did you know that was a worthwhile opportunity to chase versus it, focus or i think the thing was it for us is it it's not it's the opportunity the opportunity was bigger but the the, the other thing was is that it's more what we wanted to do mm. so it's it makes it easier <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 one thing that's always impressed me about you and Chris is you guys always seem to be on the cutting edge when it comes to these kind of new innovative things yeah. that come later on like you saw the trend with Kickstarter you guys were one of the first to do Kickstarter in Australia yeah. then you saw the opportunity with Shopify one of the you know early Shopify customers you saw the opportunity with Facebook ads some of the first doing Facebook ads um, like what are you doing right now oh probably some of the oh, for me that I think what happens is at the start, the stuff, these things aren't, they're interesting after. Yeah. So you've got to be interested in them when they're not that sexy, not that cool. Because I always, I always tell the guys, like, when, you know, it's a lot that gets talked about, as you know. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who do the talking and there's probably more people that talk than do almost. It feels like these days, that's what yeah. you see. So the opportunities and the things that, that aren't being talked about at mass scale, I think. I remember something simple like video ads. Like we started hammering video ads, amazing. I felt like it was two years and then all of a sudden it was like video ads, video ads, video ads. I'm like, well, we're, we're using that as part of the strategy. It's not the whole strategy. So it's things we're doing now, it's not, it's probably less, not like this sexy hack or um, thing, but something that we have done the last, just in the last two years is really pull out of what like traditional uh, distribution. Mm. So what we've done is, you know, we used to, you, you start a brand like us and yep. you get some customers and you start selling online and you start selling in some stores. Then you start working with some mid-level distributors. Then you think, oh, I just got to get to the big best distributors and you do that. And then you think this is going to be great. And then the whole world is changing in retail and e-commerce and all this. And you feel it's like what you should do. Then when you really, really be true to yourself, I think well, for us anyway, we look at it and we're like, this is not really the interesting thing. This is not really where the market's going. It may be where it's still sort of currently at, but you don't want to be, like if the market's going like this, you don't want to be shooting for here. You want to be shooting for where it's going to be when, you, when it gets there kind of thing. So we sort of think we feel the market's going that way. So you know, we took some hard decisions, turned off a heap of rev, a lot of difficult conversations, but then moved to, you know, more so back to controlling our own destiny. You know, when you buy the Quadlock, you're pretty much getting it from, from Quadlock. There's yeah. a few really good distributors that we have in certain markets, Australia's one of them, yeah. um, but Australia's very different. Like we haven't been Amazonified like a lot of the other markets. So I think you'll see, we'd started that probably 2018-ish. Yes. Yeah. And I'm just starting to hear people doing it now. Like when you hear Nike pulling back off of Amazon and things like that, you start to see that people, I think really, keeping their finger on the pulse it's yeah the relationships with the customer is the where the value's at and i think people that farm that out are gonna yeah wish they hadn't in the next couple of years coming back um you did the open a case but then you kind of pivoted yeah. we sort of saw that we saw that as open a case was a like a guinea pig like an experiment yeah what what would happen if we did this yeah. cp sort of had the idea of the quad lock before we had the idea of open a case but it just seemed bigger harder to get off the green and it was the idea was a bit different it was the idea was mainly to put the phone on the bike yeah. which was how we launched it but then we thought it can be bigger than that again mm. 
But I think one of the keys there was we didn't, I don't, th if, we, if we had to launch Quadlock as the everything product it is now, it probably would have been very difficult. Yeah, and we learned that along the way. Yeah. You, you changed from the, the opener case we to Quadlock? We didn't both at the same time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we had opener case in the market and then like six, I don't know how long, maybe six months later. Yep. Towards the end of that year. Yeah, then we launched the crowdfunding project for Quadlock. Yep. And three months after that, got it into the market. And then it didn't, it didn't open a case because it was sort of fatty and a bit sort of unique yeah. and a bit polarizing. People hated it or they freaking loved it, but they wanted to talk about it, right? Yeah. It just sort of sold really well, really quickly. Yeah. And Quadlock case was that slower burn, but we just always believed that when we got it right, as in the pit mark, not the product, the product was like still the same bike mount that gets sold now, so that was right. Um, but we thought if we can just get the traction behind this, we'll just keep building on this traction. It's not gonna be this fatty kind of little spike that we could see the opener was probably gonna be. So you eventually shut opener down, yeah? Yeah, eventually we, we made it for another phone and then we just went, nah, we're just all quad lock. And at the time, we, like even now, we couldn't even keep up making the stuff around the quad lock ecosystem that we wanted to do. So it's kind of like, you know, that's, what, that's sort of what you were talking about before. Like there's all these opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's not that the opener case wouldn't have sold, but the work to put behind that, we may as well just put it behind quad lock because it's going to outdo it. That actually is a good segue. I want to talk to you most about like around product development. Yeah. Um, because uh, you graciously taught a module for a new course that we're launching. Yeah called e-commerce masters where we have five incredible instructors that uh, teach certain areas around scaling an e-com business and um, you know you have a reasonable amount of experience launching different SKUs I you know one of the reasons I love your your business is you know when a new iPhone comes oh, out yeah. people got to upgrade man and you and like people are fanatical about getting the new iPhone and like, you know, I'm a quad lock user. I'm, I'm going to have to get, get yeah. another and, yeah. and it integrates into your life, yes. right? Like you put it on your bike, you can put you it on your it motorbike. Most when you don't have it. Yeah, exactly. I've got it on my car, yeah. like everywhere, right? You can put it on your computer. Like, so it's just an incredible product and you've, you've kind of built the ecosystem over time. So at what point do you think people should start thinking about yeah. their next product once they've nailed it? Yeah, and the point that you make is once they've nailed it, like, because you can do it way too soon. Yeah. And I think, I've seen it, I've just seen it before. It's easy to think you'll get more by doing more, but it, it you know, more of what? More widgets or more doing a better job of the widget you already have? Yeah. To start with, I'd always choose that. Yes. And once you nail it, then, and you feel confident and you know you're building on this base and then whatever you do, builds on top of that base, that's a great time to do it. So if you're confident that you're not gonna do this and just have this fall away, that's probably for me key. If you feel that you're in a position where whatever you do is gonna build on your um, previous success, yes. it can either be something that is sold to the same customers, but often what we were doing is something that would be sold to a whole group of new customers. And we still, um, initially when we sell the crawl lock, still today, like I don't go out and say, um, you know, get something that mounts to your phone and your car and your mirror for your bathroom and you can use it um, and wirelessly charge when you're at your computer desk. And Because no one cares about everything, it's too much. We go out and say, here's the best thing to put on your bike. Here's the best thing to put on your motorcycle that's mount your smartphone. Here's the best way to have your phone next to your computer wirelessly charging while you're working. Like we do those and then guess what? We also do this and we also do that. And we've got the car mount. You love it next to your desk, grab the car mount. You love it in your car, grab the bike mount. So it's, it's very easy to be, you know, be, the old saying like, you know, better be something to someone than nothing to no one. Like it's so easy to um, complicate what you're doing. And I, it's, it's a lesson I learned when we did uh, open a case and we made the first Shopify site for that ourselves and just hacking away and we have the home page, and you went to a product page and you could buy it. And they're like, why don't they just buy it from the home page? And it was like iPhone 4 or whatever we made it for in white and black. Yeah. That was all, that was the, that was, it's so easy to have success making a website for one product. 
that comes in two colors. Like there's, n there's nothing to it, right? You can't, it's so hard to screw up. Yeah. Fast forward to now, try and make a website that when people land on the page, they may be a cyclist, could be a motorcyclist, could be, you know, a runner, they could be, you know, uh, a mum that wants to, you know, read recipes off it in the kitchen or a dad for that matter, or whatever they want to do. It's hard to, it's hard to do that. And it took us a time to work out how to do that. And we need time, money, um, you need time to just to learn. With that single simple product that you know, it's an iPhone bottle opener. I reckon guys 20 to 35 are gonna love this thing if they drink beer and have an iPhone. That is so easy to know, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, picking your battles and when you have limited funds, limited time to get it right, pick the easier battle. And then as you get good at that, start picking the harder battles, which is that new SKU, that new product, that new product market segment that you may go after, whatever that is. Because you only have so many hours in the day. You only have so much um, mental capacity to do these things. It's very easy to overload. I mean, you would have seen entrepreneurs running really fast and going nowhere. Like, it's very easy to do. So we talk about nailing it, define nailing it. How do you know when, you, when the next time is like, yes, because it could be nailing, it could be sub half a mil a year now they could be sub don't, two mil a year i don't like, think it's a no i don't think it's a number of sales i think for us being bootstrapped obviously things have got to pay for themselves because if they don't pay for themselves you go out of business pretty quick right and and even to scale a bootstrap company you actually have to have pretty good margins as well if you want to scale it pretty quick um so keeping a lot of that in mind can sometimes dictate what you're going to do because when you're talking about, especially physical product, um, even yeah, pretty much any product, a lot of dollars and energy and time gets spent before the first sale happens. Yeah. So that's got to come from somewhere. Yeah. So I like to think of like your next product, product is piggybacking off the back of the previous product. So that previous product is paying for itself, paying for everybody else, and, and it can start to pay for the new product because the new product's got to, hit the market, find its legs, work out how to do it. And that can take you to here. And then that product and that product combined can start helping pay for the next product, the next thing you want to do good. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. And I just, that's, we sort of, we did that sort of out of necessity, I think, because yeah. to scale that like with very limited resources at the time, it's, there wasn't, there was just the only way we knew how to do it, I suppose. Yeah. Let's just say you have a flagship product. Yeah. You know, you're profitable, you got yeah. good margin. Yeah. Um, you're starting to build up some cash flow reserves. Yeah. Uh, you're paying yourself okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, how do you know, like, is it, it's not, it's not market saturation. No, and I think, you know, it depends what kind of market you're in, but if you're online, yeah. there's, there's always something like, it's like you're blowing up a balloon and as you get to the edges, you just need to make the room bigger. Yes. And so what do you do to do that? So you're blowing really hard, but it's no point blowing if the room's only this big. So how do you make it bigger? And we've always found, well, I think just, just recently, we had a website called Quadlock JP, Quadlock Japan. Yeah. And like, so we're doing Japan, we've done, been there for a few years, it's going okay, it's a tricky market, but what about the rest of Asia? What if we could really open up to the rest of Asia? Okay, what do we do? Yeah, we can go make a website, but the website's not the thing what we need. What we need is a good way to get stock to people throughout Asia. So we've got to go look at that problem first, find that problem, solve that problem, then spin that other website up, plug it into that, um, that um, fulfillment partner, test it, make sure it works. First, I mean, first what we do is run some tests to see if people in these markets are even interested. And if they look like they're interested, shut the whole thing down and work out a good way of taking, because even if we have to ship it to them, you know, DHL, Express Post, and we don't make any money. It doesn't matter because it's proven a point. We, it means that the room can get bigger. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we do that, we go and do that thing. And then we spin out that new, um, that new version of the website that's working everywhere else. Then we go try to get those people. We put them in the mix. And yeah, and then all of a sudden, you've got the exact same products, but you're selling it to more people because you've got a bigger audience. And yeah, success can come from so many ways. There's so many ways, yeah. When you launch your flagship, you want to have complementaries or more flagships? Uh, for us, we tend to go for more flagships, but at the same time, um, complementary is nice. So when I say that, if, if I had a ch choice, 
between, because everything's a choice. If I had a choice between a complementary product and a new flagship product, and the barrier to entry was similar-ish, you'd always go to the new flagship product. If the barrier to entry for a complementary was really low, mm. and it was like a nice little Me Too product, then you might go down there. The thing for us is those products that are everywhere else are never as good as when the complementary product is proprietary. So for example, like if you buy it for your bike, for the best, for the longest time, our best complementary product was our car mount. Now, then whilst charging came out, we turned the car mount from a complementary product. It's because our car mount is say $50, right? Yep. So you've bought your, depending what currency you're in, say it's $69.95 USD or 80 bucks AUD, bike mount, and you're in the system and you're sold on the system. Yes. Going and buying a $50 car mount is not that big a deal, right? Yes. When you get hit up later, you're already sold. Yep. Perfect, thank you. Grab that. But trying to sell to someone a $50 car mount plus a $34 case when they don't really know about our solution and how good it is, and there's, it's right next to something that could be $20, it's a harder sell, right? Um, while this charging comes out, all of a sudden, our, probably our best sort of um, complimentary upsell product, which was our car mount to all of the runners and the cyclists and everything, whilst charging made us unique and different in that market again, where you just snap your phone on and you're whilst you're charging through the quad lock mech. All of a sudden, that product has become a standalone product. And yeah, it's like a hundred bucks or something, but it's unique, it's quality. It's got more for people to get in, involved with initially. So, it's, it's not always like a clear line is what I'm getting at, like complementary flagship. Was complementary has gone to full, full flagship product now doing very well, just standalone. If anything, it's onboarding people to other parts of our, of our ecosystem. And how we often talk about it is like onboarding products versus complementary. Ah. Yeah, so onboarding products is where we can go and get a brand new customer. Yep. Rather than a couple more dollars out of that existing customer. Yeah. yeah, so you should, so you guys think of it when you think of product, you've got products that are there to get new customers yep. into new, and products that are there to get new customers into certain markets. Yep. And then there are products to get existing customers to buy more product. You always have the cross sales as well, where running a good product by itself, a lot of cyclists run, they, they may be interested. And then they don't have to buy the case, they just Buy them, buy them out, put it on their arm, go for a run, great. So that's always that sort of um, cross-sell thing that you get going as well once you have a few SKUs, yeah. Like how long will it take in terms of testing? Like let's just say, because um, I know you guys didn't always do motorbike, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and as you said, you've got all these different opportunities. Yeah. How do you identify that, you know, motorbike is an incredible one to go versus yeah. X, Y, Z, Z? What do you do there? The motorbike's a good... Good one to ask the question about. We got the existing um, bike mount, yep. put on a bike, took some nice photos, chucked it up on the website, and just started marketing to people with the right kind of bikes that we knew would fit well. I think it was, I looked at these figures the other day, I think it was like, first two months was like 60 grand worth of sales, and we, like, or first month and a half, I think we ran it for, shut it down, and thought, right, we gotta get a good actual product that can fit more of the market and be specifically tailored for that market and then we went back to the drawing board, come up with something, push it to the market, learnt more, we've iterated since then and now we have, you know, now we actually have four separate motorcycle mounts that all do very well and it's it's one of our biggest categories and we've only been doing it two years. So. Yeah, wow. So you do a small test with a page to, not, in it's, that, yeah. It's not, not, every, not every situation lends itself yes. to that as well, but that one, it's seeing whether people buy it the other thing is it's seeing whether people, for us at that time, this is probably two and a bit years ago, three, three years ago probably, seeing if um, people are gonna you know, click on those ads, what the click-through rates are, what countries are interested, you know, what the conversion rates are. And then you go, if it's working at this level, if we make the proper product and we do the proper content and we do it properly, it's only gonna do better. But if it's working at that level, you gotta, we gotta go there. All right, here's a good one for you. How many SKUs you have right now in terms of, in not include the different iPhone, Android case, like actual? Physical yep. mounts? Yep. Not including all the cases. Like different sizes? I don't know. <laughs> 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 That's a dead set truth. There's a few, yeah. 
So um, it's our, the problem we're solving and a necessity needs lots of SKUs. Yeah. So, cause we have all the iPhones, yeah. iPhones still back to iPhone 5 are selling kind of thing. Have, they all have poncho covers. Yeah. Some of them have screen protectors. Yeah. Then we have, you know, three different um, mounts for cycling, four different mounts for motorcycling. We have car mounts and we have wireless charge heads and we have desk mounts and we have running armband mounts and um, yeah, we have tripod adapters. So we have lots of little bits of pieces. And, um, but the, the SKUs for what we're doing are not really important. What's important is the markets that we're serving. So, and the thing, way we think about it, probably not, we're not serving iPhone people, we're serving cyclists, we're serving uh, motorcyclists, we're serving drivers, we're serving uh, people that want, like we call it like lifestyle, like nice thing on their desk for the whilst charging, that kind of thing. So that's our actual market and that's who we're serving. So when we plus in a new category, a new vertical like motorcycle, yes. It comes with all the Galaxy customers, all the Pixel customers, Huawei customers, all the iPhone yeah, customers. Yeah, that's a so standard, yeah. It's standard, yeah. But so the easy way to look at it is, is the markets and who those people are. Whatever you feel comfortable sharing around like volume in the past 12 months, like in terms of units, rev, like what, like what kind of scale do you feel the comfortable sharing? The scale we're at at the moment is, probably a good way to look at it is, so we have six websites, we have um, like eight or nine warehouses, we sell in well over 100 countries every day. We do, you know, we move thousands of units every day. Thousands of units yeah. every day. So yeah. you, hundreds of thousands of units every year. Ah, uh, every year. Yeah. yeah, not hundreds of thousands yeah. of units every day. Yeah, yeah. so hundreds <laughs> of quite. thousands of units yeah. every year. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. there's stock leaving China every week pretty much. Yeah, wow, yeah. okay. So pretty decent scale. Yeah, yeah it's decent yeah. volume. Yeah. And the cool thing about it is, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, 90 plus percent of that all goes through um, Quadlock's own channels yep. through our website, through our Amazon stores, yep. um, through our eBay stores, that kind of thing. We don't even have any eBay stores. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're still pretty hardcore direct to consumer. Yeah. Well, we went away from that and now we're coming back pretty much back there. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we still have some really good partners that do do really good work and provide what I like to call like proportional uh, value. Yep. So. So then the next question is, you have a reasonable amount of SKUs and product and segments that you target yeah. and you know very successful volume business um in and like you know i walk down the street with you and yeah. you're like there's a quad lock there's a quad lock there's a quad lock there's a quad lock like a lot of people using this product do you think that you could achieve the same amount of revenue with less product it's a good question you could get close to it but close to it in a way, it's literally something I was looking at today. 25, 50% less product or? No, like the product's complexity comes from, cause you always have those standouts, right? Yeah, you got your, yeah. Yeah, yeah. everyone has them. 80, right? 20 man, Pareto. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's like, it's why I'm wearing, yeah, 1980 model Jordan 1s. Yeah. <laughs> They're still doing okay for Nike, I'd say. Yeah. How many other hundreds of model shoes would they have that hasn't sold 1% of what these had? Yeah. But you got to go through them to get to the. You got to, to get find to the one. gold, yeah, man. Exactly. But in saying that, there's complexities that come in. They're long-term plays. So you know, we've only been doing Pixel for um, for one model. We're doing the next model. We've just done the next model, right? Yeah. Um, we only just started doing Huawei. Yeah. But when we started doing Galaxy, that wasn't that great for us either. Yeah. But now it's it's really good. So you know, where they'll be if we do this in two years' time. It looks insignificant, almost annoying-ish now to do because it can, but you've got to do that hard work for then to have two or three models of phone to then we be talking about this and, and it could be 10% of what we do or I don't know, 20% of what we do, I don't know. But you've got to go through that. And so, and it happens with lots of things, you know, you introduce a, uh, it's not just a new SKU, brings you into a new market, you know, our desk mount wireless charger. There's a very new, it's not active, not activity based, very new for us, great upsell. We've got to learn how to sell that on its own two feet and get people to be wanting to engage and realize, because everyone who gets is telling how much they love it. Yeah. But then we've got to go find people and say, actually, you're the kind of person that would like something like this. How about that? Don't worry if you don't like it on the bike. This is the new thing that is good for you. 
And when you launch it, it may not, you may be selling it to all your existing customers, but you may have a chance to have this new onboarding product that can then turn into this thing that can bring in a whole heap of brand new customers. Because anytime you can get new customers, for me, that's where the, um, the real value is because only because we know we do a good job of looking after them and keeping those customers. If yes. we didn't keep the customers and the new customers wouldn't be as valuable as they are, but because we, we're very um, um, lucky that we have the kind of ecosystem, we end up being able to attract really good customers. They like what we do and they come back. An initial sale is worth much more than that initial sale. Yeah, so what I'm hearing, um, I have at Epiphany is Yes, you could achieve the same amount of revenue with, with less product, but launching pr but new product- But would you be, but two years from now, maybe you'd be at less, less revenue. That's right. So you guys are launching new products and the, and the power of, of launching more product is the data that you get for where new markets might appear. Big time, yeah, one, one big part of it. The other thing is I think after a certain time, and I don't like talking about this too much is, you get that kind of flywheel effect where you've already got momentum and it, and it can keep, yeah. parts of the business can keep himself going because if we stopped advertising today, we will still sell tomorrow. Mm. And why do you know, you... six months from time, like maybe we won't be getting many new customers or whatever, but it, there's a bit of that flywheel effect that goes on, but you can't, these are all things I don't think you want to bank on. Yeah. You've got to make it work without them. And then when they kick in, it's very nice. Yeah, so why don't you like talking about the flywheel, man? Because, like if I had been thinking about the fly, well, maybe you start when you're early on, maybe you start giving yourself excuses that, oh, this will get better when, this will work if this happens, this will, I, I, I don't, yeah, any, I like being, no, we need to fix this now. And then if it kicks in and does better, great, loving it. It'll make our jobs easier at some point. But yeah, I don't, yeah, I just feel what we do, we never want to be, um, waiting for something to happen or waiting for something to kick in or waiting for an opportunity to come by it's like no 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 like let's go fix that thing let's make that opportunity let's go find out if there's a way we can do it better now yeah and if there is let's do it yeah yeah because um one thing i find interesting even when i look at founder is, is we're a products business too in yeah. many aspects you know magazines books yeah. courses now i think in many ways that everything's a product yeah yeah and I think in many ways, the way you can scale a company is, is through volume of product and, yeah. and finding one customer or a certain kind of person yeah. and you know, serving them in many different ways and, and tackling different problems yeah. for them. Yeah. Um, and that's how a lot of companies scale. But I think it's, do. A, yeah, do. Yeah. it's a fine dance though when it comes to e-com because you can do it too early. You can definitely do it too early. And, and it's not, especially physical hardware products because the thing is that new widget that you may be making, the first one might cost you $100,000. And if you can only go get 100 customers with that, it's not really gonna work out kind of thing. So you've got to test, you've got to learn, you've got to try and make sure you're doing the right thing. You know, I mean, it can cost you a lot more than $100,000. It just, yeah, cost you a lot. But that's the thing. So you're never gonna be certain. You've got to be as certain as you can be. I'm curious um, when it comes to quad lock and product development, testing, launching, you got any stories of products that may have bombed or products that you thought weren't gonna do well but have done very well or is it? It's the products that we know are gonna do well, ten, gen, ten, generally tend to do very well. So you always gut helps. Well, yeah, data and the other thing is just the more you're selling to a similar bunch of people, you just get to know what, how they think, how they click you see the same request for similarish products come through. They don't know what you're working on, but they're asking the right questions. You see that come through a few hundred times a month. You go, okay, there's something in this. Yep. Um, but the other thing is that uh, there's things that are really great products and we get really great feedback on it that haven't done as well, but it's just because they're in a market that is harder to stand out in a lot of ways. So I think our armband is a great example of that. The product is good. People who use it love it. Yes. Um, people run so much with it, they wear out the armband. We had to. We now sell replacement straps, so you can just go on and buy the straps. So the people that use it love it. The thing is, that product could be bigger, could do well, because the, the the market's huge for it, right? It's maybe bigger than the recycling market. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Thing is, though, it's a very saturated market. There's heaps of stuff out there. It's hard to stick out. Ours is 
done differently with a quality case. It's just completely different to everything that's there. It's harder for us to stick out in that market and we do okay. Does it do brilliantly? P probably not. Um, yeah, it's just one I think about sometimes. So would you say that um, at the scale that you guys are at and the, the things that you're thinking about is like a competitive advantage for you or any company that's in the products business and they're playing, mm. you know, with reasonable dollars and, uh, you know, you guys are a market leader in your space. The competitive advantage and the number, one of the biggest things you need to focus on besides creating good product yeah. that people want is that speed of implementation. Yeah, so that's something that we're working on right now, like to just, you know, do more, be faster, get more to market. Um, we're investing in that area to try and um, up our output effectively. The one thing we have on our side is what you said, being the market leader is even if two companies pop up today, this has happened, yep. can pop up today and have a greater product range than us. Yep. The thing that you can't have, you can't just manufacture it like that. You can manufacture product, you can't manufacture the brand the that's ecosystem. synonymous with the uh, problem that you're solving. So people that pop up, like I've seen it, like you, things that pop up on Facebook and that that look similar to that, they just get hammered. This is a Quatlock coffee, a Quatlock knockoff, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Um, and, you know, they can sell it, they can sell it a bit cheaper, they can do this. Like, it's going to take time for them to build a brand around that problem that they're solving yeah. and the products that they're offering. So they may have a bigger product offering, but when the brand doesn't match up with the product offering and what it is, it, just, it still doesn't have quite the cut through. And then we have other copies type product or, or emulation products that are like, they just go to the market and go, we're just gonna try to do similar thing and just do it cheaper. The thing for us is that's not that big of a worry either because the person that wants it at half the price of what we sell it for, mm. and it's an inferior product, but even, even putting that aside, they're probably not our customer anyway. They're yeah. not the quite lot customer. So it's kind of like- Yeah, you guys are a premium product. Someone can go and, yeah, someone else can have that part of the market. It's yeah. not the part that we want because We've, we've got this part and that's what we're doing well. And yeah, there's this part and there may be mad volume there as well, but you, it's hard to go and get the whole thing. We'll just take our part that's here. So I'm curious, like, cause you guys have had heaps of copycats yeah. um, a lot, uh, cause you are a market leader. Yeah. Um, does that like concern you? Oh, uh, it's something does it weird. Get to you? Uh, you it doesn't say to get people? to me anymore. Yeah. It's, 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 it's almost laughable when they, another one pops up sometimes. And just what's funny is when the product's similar, but then the video is almost like <laughs> frame for frame, same. The website is just rehashed, that kind of thing. Um, do they ever last? Do they, do they stick, uh, stay, so stay around? The, no, most of them don't. One or two have. Yeah. One or two uh, have become um, like competition. It's, it's, it's a funny game. Look at customer reviews. Yep. Um, we, we put our reviews right there for everyone to see. Companies, companies do that as well. But when we've got, I was showing someone new at work this just yes, last yesterday, and she's like, oh, so you've got 3,600 on this single product and they've got six. I'm like, yeah, and that's only 3,600 in the US. Let's go to the EU store. We've got another like two and a half thousand yep. that. And so you go, okay. I still think we're doing a fair bit more when they copy us anyway. And, they, and that just comes back to like, they may have a brand name, they may have a widget. How long has that brand name been pushing that widget? When people think about what's the thing that locks an iPhone to the bike, people think quad lock. If you go on Google Analytics and type in iPhone bike mount, you can see the iPhone bike mount search go down and now quad lock's a bigger search than the actual organic search term. So yeah, at crazy. that point, you know, like we've got something that's gonna take quite a bit of work for someone to knock us off. You guys are a category in, killer. In saying that, you just, you ought, you got to keep the edge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, well, don't, that's what... you don't want to get complacent because you know, you know, you can grow fast. You can, you can probably go the other way fast as well. We haven't experienced it. We don't want to. Yeah. But yeah, we just want to make sure we, we we hold our spot. And I think a lot of it comes back to like, we'd rather put out you know one good thing than four average things. Hundred percent. And we just got to keep that in mind because yeah. it's also the quality, the branding, the price point, all that is the story we tell ourselves and our customers. It's also the expectation that we have, you gotta have of yourself and your customers will have of you. So the expectation is that we've got this thing and you've had three or four quality, you go, this is gonna be good. You, don't, you may, may not even look any further, but this is gonna be good, I'm gonna buy that. Cause they're sold already. So you gotta respect that and you gotta try and you know, live up to that. And like, 
not every brand is going to live up to it every single product every single time but you just got to make sure that if you don't you're there to fix it and then you get that product to where it needs to be yeah that's a really interesting point because it is a fine dance around like you know we both can agree that yeah in order to scale and continue to scale you need more products and you need to speed up that product growth cycle um, of getting to market like that's your competitive advantage if it usually takes you 18 months if you can drop that down to 12 or six months then you can put out three times more new product and give yourself the chance to get that data and find you know your next tipping point product but then at the same time you have to have some sort of scoring around you know what like does this product hit this like yeah, what the benchmarks yeah, yeah. of, of yeah. because you can put out a whole ton of rubbish I mean, and lose you know totally i mean we're at the point because say uh getting a product to mark for us is a big thing we're at the point where we sort of do the dead set winners yeah if you know what i mean so we're sort of picking those dead set winners and going do we, we're back in the sure thing yeah yeah so it probably there's a space where like every we're all learning there's probably a space where you're doing two or three dead set winners, one outlier or something like that, you know, or some some other product that is a bit of a red herring, but it could be really cool in your product mix. Yeah, one thing I think is really smart as well that you guys have done is you've created a brand yeah. and you've, 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 you're not just like the, yes, you do have the mount market, but you can bolt on other, other things, things in, in different yeah. areas. And yeah. I think a lot of companies, they get pigeonholed yeah. uh, product-based businesses where they even call themselves something yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, specific. Yeah. And then how do you get out of it? Because when you have a product-based business, things die. I had, a, I had two conversations over the break with two separate people. And, I, and they were talking quad lock of the quad. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, how'd you come up with that? Like, well, it's the quad and it locks on. And then I realized the actual name quad lock now, in some people's mind who just maybe, it's just a thing. It's yeah. not the quad that lock, like, you know, it's not a quad point that lock, it doesn't, no, no, no. It doesn't matter. And I thought, ah, that's very, very good. Mission yeah, accomplished <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a good lesson. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah. a good lesson. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, one thing I think about, cause we found like, as I said, we're a products based business yeah. and we're trying to, same as you, yeah. you know, speed of implementation, speed to market, but still keep great quality. Yeah. Um, but it's it, a brand as well. It's the brand, so you, you've got the brand, so we can bolt on yeah. different things. But one thing that we and I'm always thinking about is that S curve. Yeah. Do you know much about? Like, have you heard about the sort of the S curves, where when while you, one product's yeah. going, you've your job when when you're at a decent scale, yeah. you your job is to find the next one, so then you can keep growing, right? I think so, it's like that piggybacking yes. idea. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't know it was called the S curve. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're called S curves. Probably sounds better than piggybacking. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. So um, that's another thing to think about, right? Is like. Yes, you might have winning products right now, but and you know it's it's a fine dance, but you have like it will die out. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. like the yeah. Nokia mobile phone, you know, the when you were playing Snake, I used to love that. That died out, man. The value is in the relationship with the customer, because mm. your widgets will change. Yep. But if you got that relationship with the customer, as well as a brand, because it'd be easy to have a brand that's only sold through. I don't know, a whole heap of other stores and you've got no other way. And when your widget dies, they don't need you anymore. And even if they put that brand on the shelf of something, if you don't have that way of talking to that community and explaining this is who we are and this is now what we're doing or or pushing that new thing into that market, if you just become that uh, one widget solving one problem, you will never, yeah, you'll never be able to live through something like that effectively where, where you've got that relationship with your customer and you've got, more than just a customer database that's a whole bit of emails of people that you know and you know where they're going to buy and what they're going to buy and all that. More than that, the data is nice, but if you've got a relationship with them and they trust you, it gives you the opportunity to do all these other things. Because you know? if they've had a couple of good experiences with you, they'll, they'll, they'll want more. Yeah, I agree. So I'm curious, what things should people be thinking about when it comes to deepening that relationship, yeah, going I think, deeper? I think... Uh, besides having a great product. Besides having a great product, is yeah i think all these things all these little things we talk about can work if you've got a great product you yeah. have a great product yeah, yeah, then yeah, you're in trouble that's, that's, as well yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's. but um i talk about yeah, not trying to get someone to solve your problems so if your problem is that you need to sell more don't look for somewhere else to solve that problem because when you do when they do solve it for you 
it's like a short term measure or they're going to take some more value out of that relationship or they're going to own that relationship. So you hear brands go, oh, we're having trouble selling here. Retail's dying. We need to go online. We'll go to Amazon. Like that's like a, to me, that's a nightmare. It's like, hang on, you're having trouble in retail. You want to sell online, build your own online store, get your own customers, come to your own online store. Maybe there's part of it. The strategy could be Amazon, but Amazon's not the strategy. Because Amazon can drop you, they can put in something else, you'll be competing against everybody else on that marketplace. You can't email them, you can't get them back, you can't do any of these things. So, you know, I think keep that relationship, keep that relationship strong with the customer. Keep your brand at the forefront of whatever they're doing. So they're not thinking, I'm going to go to Bunnings and get a Ryobi drill. They're thinking, I'm going to go to Ryobi and get the Ryobi drill. And so that that to me is the sort of the the plan that i think we'll see many more brands take on in the next couple of years yeah and the people are starting to do it now but i still think the it's the approach is fragmented so um rob let's talk a little bit about the course and the module you yeah, taught yeah. Uh, we talked a lot about product development obviously you spend a lot of time um Thinking about this stuff, as yeah. do I. So what can people expect to learn in your module of the e-commerce master's course? I think uh, we talked about knowing the right time to come out with that second product, second album. You know, When do you hit the market up and say, we were this and we now this and this, yes. and how do you do that? Yes. Um, the differences between that sort of um, complementary versus that you know, brand new product that's going to bring in new exciting customers, get you into a new new product market. But then we also talked about the fact that it's kind of a bit simple to think that I need to grow, I need new customers. Like there's other ways of growing your business that is developing new markets mm. and pushing that product into the new market or using your, and that could be geography based or it could be just market based within the same geography that this product can actually go between a couple of different markets. So using that same widget throughout different markets. So there's multiple ways to develop new products, multiple ways to work out how to, which products are the best ones to develop. Uh, we look at how to sort of prioritize your ideas and what could be of more or less value. Um, just because you like something, you don't ask, you know, your girlfriend and your best mate, you try and look a little bit deeper than that and see, you know, because people are only going to tell you everything's great but you may be the only person that likes that idea. So you want to work that out quick. So we touch on all of that and much, much more. Um, we have to work towards wrapping up. Um, I'm excited to get Emily to go through your particular module because I know it's going to help her in, she's going through a product yeah. development phase. Yeah. I've even talked to you about offline yeah. around, yeah, conquering that um, stainless steel and all this yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. And yeah, it's heaps to be done. Mm. Um, so I'm really excited uh, and thank you for taking the time to teach for this particular yeah, module, no for this Thank course. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Yeah, you're welcome, man. You, you, you're really good at what you do. So I want to finish off with, we were just saying offline, this is a great conversation. We hit the cameras, we hit stop. And we said, um, I said, this is a good conversation because no one talks about this kind of stuff. Like this is, we're mm. kind of talking about reasonably high level stuff around product development. and Without the beer. Yeah, without the beer. Yeah, because usually we talk about this stuff over beers. And it's not like the typical stuff you'd see on a podcast or an yeah, interview yeah. Um, where it's like your 10 steps to success. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, I just wanted to ask you, like, what, what do you think people should be thinking about if they want to build a successful multi-million dollar e-commerce brand without giving us the 10 steps yeah. to success? I think, um, yeah, don't, for sure, don't worry about the 10 steps of success. Worry about looking at people who are doing things that you wish you were doing don't compare yourself to them, but learn from them. Look at why they're doing something. Look at what they're doing and then why they're doing it. And if you can start to work some of that out, because often people are not telling you the best tricks. <laughs> and they're not necessarily tricks, they're lessons, they're learnings. It's, it's stuff that they've tried and tested and they've had success with and now they're looking for the new success. Maybe doing something similar in a different aspect of their business or Whatever it is, there's usually something there that successful people are trying to leverage off or trying to um, have similar success again, right? And so you just want to look at those people, see what they're doing and try and read between the lines because that's really where the gold is. The gold's in the lessons and the learnings. It's not in the actual tips. 
because exactly what works for them won't exactly work for you. But if you can see why they're doing it, they're doing it because they're at this point in your business. Understand that, okay, when I'm at that point, maybe that'll be relevant to me, but there's so many different bits and pieces out there that you can get. And so anytime you get that opportunity to get an insight like that, really take it. And don't take it by sitting down with a notepad, about to copy down exactly what they say. Take it in, let it wash over you and try and really look for the lessons and the learnings within it. Yeah, I love that, man. Um, one thing one of my uh, mentors, Mitch, taught me once was this concept of situational stage advice. Just because Gary V says that, you know, you should respond to every yes. single person uh, on, you know, your Instagram yeah. account. If you're just starting, yeah. like you don't have time to do that. And that might not be the best use of your it time, may not be, yeah. but he's got like, you know, a thousand person staff. But like, what that means is I've got to try and get back to a few. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when he says you've got to do a hundred content pieces, you're like, can I do that? <laughs> Probably not. Can I do more than I'm doing today, tomorrow? Probably. Yeah. Look, thanks so much no, for your time. You. And uh, yeah, always a pleasure, oh, bro. Always. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. mate. Awesome. Hey, guys. So I hope you enjoyed this in-depth conversation with Rob about everything product development and uh, scaling your e-commerce brand. And uh, if you enjoyed this and you'd like to learn more on, you know, how to actually scale your e-commerce brand and you actually have an e-commerce business and, you know, you, you got revenue, you're trying to grow it, you know, let's just say, you know, you, you've got a couple of team members and you've got a product that sells quite well or a couple of different products and you want to learn from Rob and five other incredible instructors that have all built multi-million dollar e-commerce brands. Make sure you go to founder.com forward slash e-commerce masters or founder.com forward slash advanced e-commerce. We've launched this incredible course. We've found legit practitioners, not gurus, people that spend most of their time, all they're doing is growing their businesses. They don't teach this stuff. We've twisted their arm to actually teach like what they're learning, building real businesses. So if you want to learn more, I highly recommend you check out that course. And if you do want to start, like you haven't started an e-commerce store, make sure you check out our other course called Start and Scale by Greta. Uh, she's an incredible founder. She's built four multi-million dollar e-commerce stores. She's our instructor for how to start your own e-commerce store. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you leave a comment below. Let us know if you have any questions, like uh, where you're at with your e-commerce store. We'd love to hear. We respond to every single comment. Make sure you give us a thumbs up and hit like, and uh, I'll see you in another video. The founder mission is to help you create an ass-kicking business and help you learn straight from the mouths of world-class founders. Get your free printed edition of Founder Magazine featuring Sir Richard Branson. Just cover shipping and handling at founder.com forward slash Branson.